He's an absolute incredible leader. And I've had the pleasure of learning from him, listening to him. And I feel that we've all, in some way, uh, been connected with John over the years. And so today's our opportunity to, to really get close uh, and understand what goes on inside a high-performance leadership mind. So John, without further ado, I'd love to start with, you know, when you think of leadership, what comes to mind? Well, I've just got a new leadership role, actually, because I went to go to the bathroom and I've joined the walking group that's out there. So, you know, um, <laughs> apparently they're way better at solving the problems of the world than the current government is, which I had, <laughs> sort of had to agree with, actually. They look like the average IQ was higher anyway. So, um, <laughs> and we're off. Uh, yeah, we're off. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know. So what comes to mind, look, I, I reckon um, it, when you really think about it, we overcomplicate things actually. You know, life, is, um, life can be very, very complicated when you're only as happy as your unhappiest child type of thing. But, you know, fundamentally, I think if you look at, say, business from a starting point of view, um, in many respects, uh, and I think it doesn't matter whether it's solely business or whether it's, you know, running a school or being part of a team or whatever it might be, um, one of the first things is, what does success look like and can you write it down? Because actually what you find when you go to most places is, if you go and individually ask the members of that team, what is success for your organisation, they'll write down 10 different things. They never write down the same thing. And you'd think they would, you know, you'd think, oh, a company's making profit. Well, yeah, okay, maybe it is, but it's also about... You know, ultimately building long-term brand loyalty and doing the right thing for the society and community that you live in because actually without that social licence to operate, you're never going to make it, whatever. And, you know, a, a sports team, you can say it's about winning, but when they get so arrogant and disconnected from the people that actually support them, um, then what actually happens is they don't go on and succeed long-term because it infiltrates their their sort of community, and I didn't hear Steve yesterday, but I think if you go back to sort of Graham Henry and I think Richie McCaw, um, I think they made very significant changes actually to the All Blacks when they sort of brought in a culture that said, actually we're all the same, you know, the big guys don't just sit in the back of the bus, you know, the young, the young All Blacks don't go and get the older All Blacks coffee, they carry their own bags, they do all that stuff. and that was all just about building a culture, and I remember in the 2015 World Cup, which, by the way, we never lost a World Cup when I was Prime Minister, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, you know, just in case you were forgotten that little fact, we won both of them, you know? Like when we turned up, we, we <laughs> won, you know, the gold job. medal, all that shit. But anyway, I digress. But, but there was this, a really interesting story about the All Blacks were out at a little school down the road and they were throwing the ball around with some young kids. And the England rugby team, who were the, you know, home, home supporting nation, they were locked away in some swanky sort of joint. And I think it sort of said it all. So I think the first thing is, you know, can you define what success looks like and do you have a collective view of that? I think the second thing is, look, it's always people. You know, you can sort of argue, you know, like, I mean, but I came out of investment banking. It's absolutely true when you're in Parliament. I mean, you know, the, your, your strongest assets go up and down the lift every day and without those people. And then, and I think the thing is, can you work out actually how to connect with them and how to motivate them? Because often I think, again, we think about, oh, the really big things, but it's often the little things actually that make a difference. Um, and then the last thing I'd sort of say is really about predictability. So it almost doesn't matter whether you're kind of, you know, on the spectrum, half crazy, yell and scream, go nuts. Um, or you're on the other side where you're very chilled and laid back. I mean, every leadership style has its strengths and weaknesses, but it's when you start over here and you end over here that people go, whoa, what happened today? You know, I can't work that out. Whereas so I'm pr pretty laid back. I'm not really a yelling, screaming, phone-throwing kind of guy. Um, other people I worked with have been, um, but it was actually okay. I sort of understood where they were coming from, and I just ducked every so often, and I was fine, you know? It was all good. <laughs> um, so that's, they're the main things I'd sort of say, really, is yeah. the starting point. And in terms of role models, Steve mentioned this yesterday, he felt that we only have one or two role models in our life, true role models, and he said that's our parents. Yeah. So if you think back to your younger days, what impact did your mum or dad have on your leadership? Yeah, so my father died when I was six, and I literally, five or six, and I have literally no memories of my father. So I, grew, I actually grew up in Christchurch, went to Burnside High, um, but, but I was born in Auckland. And sort of my family history, like some people may know it, but it was kind of interesting that my mother was an Austrian Jewish refugee. 
So in 1937, she got out of Austria and went to the UK, and she was 16 years of age. And the way that sort of worked, in New Zealand, we have a thing called family reunification. So say, okay, you're Irish, right? Okay, and um, you, let's, let's argue for a moment. Um, if you argue for a moment, you, you had no parents, but you had another brother that was living in New Zealand and a sister that was living in Australia. If you wanted to bring your sister over, then the way those rules would work is the New Zealand government would say the nucleus of the family sits in New Zealand because two of the three of you are here and you have entry. That's sort of the guts of how some of that works. There's lots of other rules, but that's one of them. So back in 1937, um, that, the rules didn't work like that. The way the rules worked were you could sponsor someone to come into the United Kingdom if you, if in the case of a woman, if you were married. So it's a good sort of old-fashioned way of doing things. And so my um, aunt lived there, and she, was, um, she wasn't married, Lottie. And so she actually paid a British soldier to marry her. Um, and, you know, no love. It's a, it's a bit like, you know, Celebrity Island or whatever these damn things are these days, you know. You know, whatever. Married at first sight or I don't know. <laughs> you sound like you know a few of these shows. Oh, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm forced to endure them now yeah, because yeah. I'm on the, on the couch, you know, obviously reading The Economist or something while Brain is watching. But, <laughs> we um, believe you. Anyway, you know, but anyway, so so what happened was Lottie, Lottie married this British soldier and so... Um, and, and so the interesting thing was Mum came from this actually extremely well-to-do, you know, quite rich household. And her father had just died. He was a leather merchant but had very successful businesses in Austria. And um, her mother refused to leave and she had a brother. And the brother was two years older than mum and he also agreed to go. Funnily enough, actually fought for the British Army and was killed in friendly fire actually in the, in the Second World War. But um, all of the rest of mum's family went to the concentration camps and none of them got out. So they, they got over there and so mum, mum was 16 and so she'd been... She'd been brought up in this household where they, they um, you know, she only spoke German, they were very wealthy, you know, she had this world that she could predict and was really easy. And then next thing, she's in the UK, can't speak a word of English, Britain's going to World War II, she's got no family, no financial resources, and the whole world sort of threw itself on its head. And so um, during the war she became a nurse, and then after the war she met my father, who was, her, mum was his second wife, and so... She, they, they got married, but he was about 20 years old. So he was, he was actually reasonably kind of, I'd say old in the context of things. He's my, basically my age, but he, now, but anyway, he, but he, and he died. He had a massive heart attack and dropped down dead one day. And so mum, mum had, and, and dad were in New Zealand, and my sisters are both older than me. And what ended up happening was mum went along to the accountant and said, look, I've got three children. My um, husband's just dropped down dead. He's got all these businesses, I don't know anything about them. Um, can you sort out? And the accountant said, yeah, sure. He said, come back in two weeks. So he, she went back in two weeks and he said, the accountant said, um, do you uh, want the good news or the bad news? Mum said, oh, I'd better, better start with the, the bad news. And he said, uh, well, you're broke. And I said, ooh, what's the good news? And he said, well, I'm a pretty good accountant, I can get you out of most of it. Mum said, ah, it's not really how I operate. So she sold the family home and um, paid off a lot of the debts and picked up my sisters and took us down to Christchurch, which is how we grew up in the sort of infamous state house at 19 Holyford Ave, um, which I tried to buy off the government at one point, but they didn't want to sell it. The, um, <laughs> mind you, I tried to buy the whole street, actually, because I thought I could redevelop it. But anyway, it's a different <laughs> sort of story, but... Of course you did. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm only, I'm only kidding, you know. Um, but the the but but the long short. So 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 I never never knew my father. I have literally one memory of him. That's it. Um, so, but my mother had you know to your point basically had a massive influence on me. And so, mum was mum was um, very Austrian and very Jewish. If you know anything about Jewish matriarchal mothers, they think their sons are the best thing in the world. So she used to say in front of my sisters, your brother is the chosen one. I will, <laughs> which I 100% agreed with. I mean, I get it. I totally get it, eh? I used to say, I used to say to them, yep, 
Plus, if you just clear away those dishes, that'd be great, actually. Thank, thanks very much, girls. Okay, you know, I appreciate it. And mum used to say to the girls, oh, I would have had a fourth if I had to to have a boy. She used to call me Toots. Little Toots, he'll do something one day. <laughs> and I say, yeah, yeah, well, Toots will do something. So, yeah, it's all going to be good. Um, but mum, but all jokes apart, mum was very, so, but she was very, very determined woman. So she used to say to me, look, um, John, get out of life what you put into it. I'm not interested in excuses. I'm interested in the outcomes. And so it wouldn't, didn't matter what you wanted to do, you know, I mean, if you went in there, I mean, I went in there when I was 15 one day and said, I want to be a horse trainer. That was like, no. Do it, should we have a discussion about it? No. And that was the end of it, you know. So, um, but it was like, you're going to university, you're going to get an accounting degree. It wasn't just like, you know, like, this is what you're doing. Um, but, it, but when I went in and said, oh, I'm going to be prime minister when I was 11, she goes, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all fine. That's acceptable. Um, so she was, but she very, very determined. And she, but she main thing she used to say to me is, look, you never really know how the circumstances are going to change. You know, I grew up in this rich house. And if you asked me when I was fifteen, I would have thought life's going to be great, and I'm going to be, you know, married to some wealthy Austrian guy, and life's going to be good, eating Venice schnitzel so and enjoying things. And he said all that turned on its head, and then I would have thought everything would be fine in New Zealand, and then that wasn't fine, and then it all just carried on. So. Her, her main thing was that really, she was a massive su supporter and, and determined about education. So she just said, look, they can take anything away from you, but they can't take education away from you. And they can't take drive away from you. And I, th I think that's the main thing we've tried to instill in our children, which obviously, bluntly, come from a different financial background, you know, I mean, we, we, you know, we're reasonably well off, and so they... They, you know, they enjoy the, you know, nice things in life. They don't have to worry that, you know, they, they can't pay their rent or whatever it might be. You know, they're, this, they're all taken care of. But, but the main thing I just used to say to them is, look, in the end, you have to make your own life and you have to make your own luck and you have to do your own things. And you can put up any kind of reason why that won't work. But actually, um, the most, if you if you don't have self belief and you don't have drive and you're not prepared to work hard to get it, you won't get there. And I think. You know, it's like I used to tell kids when I used to go to schools, I mean, you know, has Dan Carter got a fantastic left foot? Yep, he does. But, you know, he also used to spend hours kicking thousands of balls over the post. So, you know, yeah, it's like um, one of the famous golfers said, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm lucky and, and the more I practice, the luckier I get. And I think it's that kind of attitude, really. Mm. And the one thing I, I pick up from that and from reading your book a few years back was you were very clear on your vision. At a young age, mum, I'm going to be a millionaire or make a million dollars, and I'm going to be a prime minister. And then the response to that was, great, support you, not, not putting it down, but supporting you to yep. get to work. So between the vision and then first milestone, what were the key things around you that helped you actually make those steps towards those outcomes? Yeah, so, I mean, the money thing was really about, you know, I think financial independence gives you confidence. And... Um, I remember, you know, in the first debate in 2008 when I was up against Helen Clark, um, I'll tell you an interesting little thing at the moment, if you follow politics, um, the, the deputy leader of the National Party is Nicola Willis, right? So, um, and if you ever get a chance to meet Nikki, she's, she's awesome. So, but she was my speechwriter and she was my uh, main policy person. I made, a, I made a leave, I made a go, I said, look, you've got to go out and get a job, otherwise you'll just be always in this political environment. So she went and worked for Fonterra and a few other things, but she is massively talented. So you know how you do these debates, and they're pretty heavy duty, these debates. You do, honestly, days and days and days of training. Like the books the, of stuff you just have to, you know, so you don't make a mistake on any policy you've got, they've got, whatever's happened, all these, because they fact check everything you do, and then you spend days of tidying up if it's wrong. Um, but you also do all the mock debates, and Nicola played um, Helen Clark. And she was better than Helen Clark. Actually, way better. Um, and I told Helen that too, because we do something together, actually, on things, trying to save the Kiwi, believe it or not. Bird, that is. And, um, but, Nick, yeah, Nikki's awesome. But, but they can't basically train you. For, you, you. In the end, you are who you are, and your instincts are there on display. And, and that was the one thing I said to Bill when, when he became Prime Minister. I said, mate, just trust your instincts. Because it doesn't matter how many briefing notes and how many people you have around you, um, You've got to trust your instincts. And that's what I do. It's what I do in everything I do, particularly in business, but equally in politics. If I don't think I can trust you or I just don't like the feel of it, I won't do it. 
And I've done some things where, or not done some things where if I'd done them, they would have been either financially the right thing or they may have well been the right thing to do, but I would never have been quite sure. But I've had many things where I, you know, where I have done it and I've, and it's worked out amazingly well because I've had that confidence that I'm right. And even when I've done that and I've got it wrong, it's okay, you know, you can change your mind or you can get, you know, nothing in the, in the end really cuts you out, but... But you have to believe and you, know, you have to have that, that amazing belief, I think, that, that you're right. And if you trust your instincts, you'll be right. But anyway, in that, in that debate, that they, they always sort of claimed I won that debate against Helen because of the one question they asked me, which was they said to her, are you rich? The question actually came from Barry Soper who's actually a really good guy, but his nickname in Parliament was Barely Sober, um, so you can go and figure that. Um, he's married to Heather Duplessy Allen. I actually really like Barry. But, um, but anyway, he, he, he was really asking the question to ask me because he wanted to trip me up, and he thought, oh, I'll get screwed on this question. So he said, so the question was, are you rich, and what does it mean to you to be rich, right? And Helen is, in the context of New Zealand, rich, right? She'd be worth... Two or three million dollars, you know, they had various houses and she'd been paid pretty well as Prime Minister and all this sort of stuff. So, in the context of the average New Zealander, she's rich. Oh, God, she couldn't answer the question. She's like, um, well, no, yes, sort of, maybe, could be, you know, I can't understand, but I meet all these people and blah, 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 right? And I said, yep, I'm rich. And um, that's cool, you know, like I'm, I want more New Zealanders to be rich. But actually what it means to me is that when the power bill turns up on, on the kitchen bench, I don't worry about opening the bill because I know I can pay it. And it gives me the confidence to do the things I want to do. And, and, if, and, and I want New Zealanders to have that confidence. So the reason I wanted to make money wasn't just, you know, it's obviously value. Money, there's a famous economist called Samuelson and he said, Money's value in exchange. So in other words, it's what you can do with it. I mean, the, 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 the richest person in the graveyard isn't necessarily the smartest, you know? If you never spend anything, you never do anything, what's the point in having it, you know? It's only what you do with it, you know? But, but equally, it does give you tremendous confidence that you can, nothing's kind of going to cart you out. And, and you see that with health, um, you know, like... We had, unfortunately, my brother-in-law died about a year ago of cancer here. And, um, and I've got to say, actually, I don't think the system worked terribly well, if I'm really, really honest. Um, and there were many faults on, on numerous sides. But anyway, I had this melanoma and it killed him. Um, but we did, we did everything we could to try and support him and various different drugs and various different procedures and lasted a year but didn't save him. But if you didn't have, if you didn't have access to those financial resources, you could never have done that. Now... In the end, you can make the case, if you just want to be crude about it, he died, but yeah, he still lasted a year longer than he would have. Mm. But, I mean, it's that a horrible feeling that you feel helpless, I think. So that's why you want people to be wealthy, I think. It just gives them choice. 100%. And if we go back to your time as Prime Minister, what were your priorities? Because you can't focus on everything. You can't keep everyone happy. Of course, you're going to have your critics. But what were the key things and objectives you were focused on? Yeah. And funnily enough, actually, I'll tell you one thing. The, I'm chairman of ANZ. Um, which made $2.3 billion yesterday. So um, that was quite a good day, the office. The, <laughs> funnily enough, actually, it, I know it sounds like a lot of money because it is a lot of money, but, but we, we have massive... I mean, we have a $220 billion balance sheet. We've got $20 billion of capital invested. You know, in bad times, we lose money. So, yeah, look, it's, I, I'm not defending it, because actually I think it's a good thing the banks are strong and they're making money, but they don't always, they don't always make money. But... Um, the woman who's the CEO I appointed at, Antonia, Antonia Watson, she's awesome, she's doing a great job. And she's probably been, excuse me, in that job about four years now. But I always say to her, look, however long you think you'll be at the top, it might be less than you think. I mean, you know, I don't know. But in, in political terms, you, the day you start, you know, is the beginning of the end. I think it would be true for a sports person. And it's fundamentally true in any business, anything you do. I mean, we only have a limited time on the planet. So, you know, you only have a, you know. And I just said to her, look, when I look back on being Prime Minister, the only things I ever think about was, did I go fast enough on some of the things that I wanted to do? And what were the things that I wanted to achieve? And 
So, because we don't live in this magical world where you can just ignore the environment that you're in. We live in the real world. So when I came in, we had the global financial crisis, which was huge. Mm. Then we had the Christchurch earthquakes. You know, then we had various other sort of you know financial and, and, and other issues that went on. Then we had a bunch of different things we had, you know, that we were trying to resolve. And so, so the first thing is that. The, pro the priorities were really how do we get through those different things to make the country stronger. But I suppose if there was one underlying thing that you wouldn't write down, I wanted New Zealand to, New Zealand to feel more confident at the end of it. Um, the infamous sort of changing of the flag was really nothing to do with the flag. I know it sounds stupid, but um, yeah, you know, I kind of cared about it. I mean, I, like, I cared a lot about the issue, but... But the flag was just a symbol of um, who we are and that, uh, you know, having more overt signs of patriotism. So when you go to America, you see flags, and I spent lots of time in the States, and, you know, they just fly flags everywhere. They, you know, even Australia, I tell you, I mean, their flag is pretty similar to ours, like kind of AKA identical, and you can't tell apart in half time. That's another reason I wanted to change because it got put in front of the Australian flag so often. But <laughs> the... But the reality was that when we want to f show pride in New Zealand, is we wear a silver fern, right? That's what we do to... If, we were, if you were in Istanbul this afternoon, you wanted to walk down the street and show people you're a Kiwi, you wouldn't put a T-shirt on with the New Zealand flag. Firstly, you probably don't even own one. But even if you did own one, you probably wouldn't do it because people would go, you know, g'day. You know, they'd think you're Australian. <laughs> or they'd think you're something else. But, but actually, you'd wear the silver fern, right? And... I wanted. I just sort of think philosophically. We, you know, we are, you know, famously the bu last bus stop on the planet. We're a little country at the bottom of the world. No one knows us living. But if we could be more confident, more globally engaged, more, more of the view that we were going to win, um, then, then I think actually we would be a better country for it. And. Look, I do worry. Like, if I'm really, really honest, I look at today and I go, okay, so you've got. Virtually no migration allowed into the country. It's slowly starting to change, right? So unemployment's at these incredibly low levels, right? You've got every employer I can think of screaming for workers, but we've got 420,000 New Zealanders on a benefit. Now, some of them will legitimately be unable to work. You know, they've got, they've got all sorts of issues, physical conditions, mental health issues, whatever. You know, there's a variety of reasons. So I'm not, I'm not you know, taking anything away from that. But th what I am sort of saying really is that the only pathway out of poverty is work, and the vast bulk of people who are in poverty live on a benefit. That's just blunt reality, because actually income rates are low. And so the question for me was, how do, you, how do you actually put in place those drivers to make people work, I think? Because I thought, if you do that, actually you'll transform their lives, you'll make them you'll make them do that. And, and there's a proven fact, by the way, like you go and ask the Ministry of Social Development, they'll tell you if you go through, say, Maryvale, pick a suburb, at night, at two o'clock in the morning, the lights are off. If you go through Tokoro at two o'clock in the morning, the lights are on. And I'll tell you why they're on, because there's a lot of partying going on at two in the morning, because they're not going to work the next day. And as soon as they get one person to get a job in that household, everything changes. Because then they get up and they make the kids go to school and they go off to work and everyone sees that their life is changing. So, you know, so I guess my point would just simply be whatever the things that you think are important, and they, they, they were some of them for us, some very practical and some more high level, just have them in mind and go after them because your time will run out and... I, don't, I actually don't look back with regrets. I mean, I think it's a journey, not a destination, being Prime Minister. You know, you're always going to you know, leave some things. But, you know, I do, I do kind of think that that's, for me anyway, that was... I, you know, look, they always say infamously, you know, the definition of a good Prime Minister is when you leave the country in better shape than you found it. And that is hugely subjective. So yesterday, I was driving along the motorway, and um, this woman in a... I just happened to notice the car was a Toyota Swift, spent most of the time between Northcote and the Harbour Bridge pulling the finger at me. Now, it could be that I cut her off, but I was saying to my wife at dinner this last night, 
And she, she said, well, you're notorious for changing lanes without indicating. I said, I didn't change lanes. She said, you're notorious for being on your phone. I said, hey, I have hands-free. I was, I was on my phone, but I was like, hands-free. And, I, and she said, my wife eventually said to me, what do you think the reason this nice woman did that 10 times to you? And I said, because she hates my guts, honey. <laughs> and, right, and, and, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's plausible. I believe that. Yeah, I believe that. I get it. And so my point being, in the eyes of that woman, if this was the reason, which I suspect it was, it was like it was just me, um, She'll always believe I didn't achieve that. And then in the eyes of some people who were supporters of mine, they'll say, you did do that. So the point is, you're never going to please everyone all the time. But, but you have to, you have to I, th I think, I think that is true, that a good Prime Minister does leave the country in better shape. And I think if that's, that's the argument, you have to work out what better shape looks like. And, and some of those things are hard, but there are education standards and homelessness and all sorts of things. But it's also opportunity for people to get out there and strut their stuff, really. 100%. Encouragement. When we think about making decisions, so we all make decisions uh, day in, day out at various levels uh, in our personal lives, professional lives. Making decisions in good times, it's easy. It's easy, yeah. How do you go about making the decisions when it's tough, when it's GFC, when there's a war, when there's earthquakes? How, how do you make clear decisions? Yeah, I think the first thing is you have to realise you're never going to please everyone all the time. I mean, it's just a simple reality. I mean, Holyoke used to say when he was Prime Minister for the party agrees with me, 70% of the time I'll be about right. And um, that's probably true. You know, so I think the first thing is you have to have real courage of your convictions. You, know, like you have to believe you have to believe you're doing the right thing. Like I said earlier, trust your instincts. Eventually, you have to make decisions. I think you need clarity in that. You know, you have to be able to say, "This is why I'm doing that." So, if you, um, so Nicola Willis always used to say to me, and I think she's right actually. It's it's all about motivation and the method. So, if you're a politician trying to sell tax cuts, it's not actually that I'm lowering the top personal rate from 39 to 33. It's about, I want New Zealanders to have greater incentives to get out there and take risks and to work hard and to make money, and as a result of that, I'm doing that. So what's my motivation and what's my method for doing that? And I keep saying to Chris Luxon all the time, because I'm very close to Chris, I just keep saying to him, mate, you've got to tell them stories about why it is you're doing what you're doing. Because we get it, we live in a world where it's just very simple to bark out the answer. And you, you might know the answer, but that's like, go and look at any US presidential debate, and these people are schooled like you cannot believe. And it'll be Obama getting up and saying, I was in Wichita, Kansas yesterday, and I met Molly, and Molly's a mother of two, and you know, she's you know, down on her luck, and she doesn't have a job, and so she doesn't have health care. And, and, and she's, they're painting a mental picture for you. Mm -hmm. And why? Because that's what we can understand. Because I tell you what, we all get really confused. If you want to know a really sad and depressing thing, when you when you um, when you're prime minister, you end up doing all this polling, right? Which is focus group polling. So there are twenty non-aligned voters who sit down and tell you. And we do it every month, right? We'd say, name anything um, that has struck you that the government has done in the last six months. Name people in the government, right? Name this, name that. You go through the whole bloody lot. Okay, mostly, no clue what they've done the last, you know, can't name a single thing. They'd get me, in, in the government, they'd get me, um, Bill, and Jerry, because he's a pretty big, big dude. <laughs> That's it. They're the only people they can remember. Honestly, I swear to God. I remember Chris Finlayson, who Chris is a, a, like academically brilliant, eh? but this most acerbic wit and very, takes himself very seriously. And he came in one day because they'd written an editorial in the Dominion Post about how terrible something he was doing was. I said, cool, cool, Chris, you should look at this. He goes, what's that? I said, it's this month's polling. And he goes, why should I look at that? And I said, because less than 0.1% of people know who you are. So don't <laughs> even worry about it. <laughs> it's outstanding. <laughs> Now, he didn't seem to appreciate that response, uh, but I thought it was all right. I love yeah. it. But anyway. It's funny you mentioned Chris Luxon. So recently I've seen a, you put up a bit of a post uh, sharing a story. He was at McDonald's flipping burgers. Yeah, well, I saw it in the news last night. Yeah. yeah, really interesting. And when you and I chatted a few years back, and I was telling you I've been interviewing different leaders, and you said, James, if there's one leader uh, that I'd like you to interview that who I regard as one of the best CEOs that New Zealand has had, yeah. it's Christopher Luxon. So I went ahead and did that and was incredibly impressed. Yeah with his acuity, his insight, and the way he delivers as a leader. So just to unpack that a little bit, what is it that you look for in a great leader? What are the attributes you see and you go, yeah, 
amazing leader right there. Well, part of it has to be that a general belief that you want to follow them, I think. I mean, um, the most charismatic leaders in the world are often the people that they just have a certain thing about them. Now, partly office creates that. So the office of the President of the United States of America, I mean, it's like it is unbelievable. Like it's a, it's a, it's a footprint you can't even imagine. You know, they turn up with two 747s and they fly around. You know, they, their car is the beast. The coffee cup they have is the seal. I mean, look, it's incredible. So you can't help but be like, whoa, you know. Although I don't feel like that with Biden, I've got to be honest. But, you know, but with Obama and the others, you know, I kind of did. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think part of, it, part of it is that they have to be, somehow along the line, they have to kind of inspire you. And they don't necessarily always have to have an A-type personality. It might be that they are just, you're just in awe of their capacity to do the things that they've done um, and the respect for where they're sort of going. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of look for that sort of, do they have that X factor, I suppose, or that thing. Part of it is, you know, do I actually want to be with them? Like, are they actually half decent people, really? But ultimately, can they gather around them, the people that we need to make this thing work? Are they kind of doing the things that I want them to do? Is there some sort of balance about it? And how do you grow leaders? So, obviously, you've had to grow teams of your own in yeah. politics, but also in the, the corporate world. How do you go about growing and influencing others around you? Uh, well, first you have to give them space. I mean, I think, you know, I... Um, I think there's a, there's a difference between being so hands-off that you never offer any feedback and you never get involved and you're never there to back them up. But equally, if you're all over them and you're doing it, you may as well be the person that's running the show. So it, you only really... It's one of the things I worry about, actually, with you know working from home. Like, we now live in this world where you know the, we work from home. That's the sort of trendy thing we want to work from home. So at ANZ, just to give you an example, we've got you know, a better part of 10,000 employees. 62% of our staff spend two days or less at home. Um, to, to, yeah, two days or less, sorry, less at work, I mean, so I say, two days or less at work. So basically the bulk of the workforce is coming to the work is coming to work one day a week, and some of them none. And the reason I worry about that is people learn through, young people learn through osmosis. They're just there, they're just sitting there, they just feel it, you know, they hear you having a discussion, you make them a better salesperson or a better this or a better that because they see it. And culture in every organisation is different. Um, and you can feel it, like the culture in, you know, in, in a certain school is different from one school to the other. It doesn't mean that one's better than the other, it's just different. It's often set at the top. Like, I remember going to Westlake Boys. They've got an English guy who's the principal there. And um, I reckon he's phenomenally good. He's quite a young guy. And it's, and, but, but I, you'd go there, it'd be 1,200 boys, and you go and speak to assembly, and he'd just walk in and like, stop like that. Like, not a sound, right? And afterwards, I was walking around with them, you know, I went a couple of times. And you're walking around and there'd be some boy walking around with his socks down and he'd just look at them and the next thing you know they'd be hitting the deck and you know, ripping their socks up. And you know, there was just that culture. And then you go to other schools and it would be like, oh, whatever. And I don't know, it just didn't, it didn't have that feeling. And Westlake's a public school. I mean, it's not a private school. So, you know, I think there's that, that, there's that kind of stuff, you know, I think. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned about the work from home thing and your concerns around it. So let's take ANZ, You've got 10,000 employees, yeah. a large amount of them not coming into the office. What are the repercussions, potential consequences of this over the next four or five years? Yeah, so I think, so firstly for those young people, I mean, how do we notice them? I mean, we can measure their workflow, you know, depending on what they do for us, but how do we, how do we you know, that's physical. So how do we mentor them and make them better? I worry that, as I said, I worry that there's a breakdown in culture. So we have a culture at ANZ, it's quite a different culture. I came out of Merrill Lynch and Bankers Trust, which were two sort of red meat eating, very investment banks. They were good and bad, they had strengths and weaknesses, but they were what they were. It was also probably a different time in the workplace, you know, it was just different. But ANZ's cultures are very polite and respectful. Like when I went on the ANZ board, and I'm on the group board and chairman of New Zealand, First couple of times we went sat board meetings, I thought, God, has everyone taken some sleeping tablet or something? Like, it's quite quiet. You know, like, I'd go to a cabinet committee and people would be ripping shit out of each other. <laughs> and it was like, but the reason they do that isn't because they're 
well, they probably are testosterone filled or whatever, you know, A type personalities. But it wasn't solely that. The reason is because what happens when you when you're in cabinet, we're bound by what's called Westminster. Um, principle. So that means that we're collectively bound. So you can have any row you want before you decide a policy or a position, but the moment you decide that law, everyone backs it. If you don't back it, the convention is you resign. Mm -hmm. right? And so what happens is, people people firstly know they've got to back it. So to back it, they want to panel beat it in the best place. It may, may not, they may never agree with what you're doing at the end of it, but you know they have to do that. Second thing is they're bright enough to know that actually it's going to be made better by people bringing different perspectives. So just to give an example, if you, if you take someone like Jerry, Jerry, we used to say Jerry is Wollstone Working Men's Club. Because that, cause he, not because he is there, by the way, he went to St. Bede's and didn't, probably never drank at the Wollstone Working Men's Club. But, he, but he'd come in and he was quite earthy and he'd just go, nah, nah, the people are sitting in there, they're going to buy that shit, you know. Nah. And we go, and we might not even like what he's saying. But we, but we would build it into what we were doing because he was right. Mm -hmm. For a big portion of the population, that's what they thought. Mm -hmm. And equally, you know, then we'd have Nikki Kay come in from the leafy, you know, you know, suburbs of sort of Auckland Central, and and she, her, and Jerry would be like, you know, God, and and she'd be going, no, nah, no, nah, yeah, you're a Neanderthal, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. You know. And, and so it was just different. And so, but you build off all of that sort of stuff, and you you learn all the different things that go on. So I think, um, and so the culture at ANZ when I went there is it's different, and it's because they don't, they they I think they would perceive being a bit aggressive as being that you were disrespecting the management or one of the other directors. And I I don't know. I mean, to me, I'm just used to more robustness. I think. Um, I've learned to get used to it, but it is different, and that's one of the things I really worry about. You know, with working from home, um, and actually, it's kind of fun going to work. I mean, I, I you know, like I, I don't work now because I need money. I, I work, I work because I, I'm so young enough to want to do some things that are different and hopefully make a bit of a difference in things I do. And um, yeah, you know, and I don't want to work like I used to work, but I, but I, but I enjoy doing stuff and being around things. I find it sort of invigorating. Um, and it's intellectually interesting to, to do things. So I've got a ba more balance in my life now, but work-life balance. But but I sort of enjoy it. So yeah, I don't know. I think um, but that's what I do worry about with this thing. Having said that, there are some good things, you know. So okay, yeah, COVID was terrible in the fact that we couldn't go anywhere. But I did teach a company like ANZ, which is really conservative. That by the way, there is this thing called the internet, and you can have a, a Zoom call, and it, life's going to be fine, right? Whereas I'm on Palo Alto Networks board, which is the largest cybersecurity company in the world, and I remember they wanted me to go on this, and 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 the cash who runs the show is an amazing guy. He said, "Yeah, we have five board meetings a year in Silicon Valley," and I said, "Ah, oh, Jesus, five board meetings in Silicon Valley? It's better than you know, like BP wanted me to go on their board, and that's ten board meetings in London." I'm, so I said, "No, we go make sure on their advisory board because it's easier." But I said, ah, oh, five, I don't know if I can get to five. He said, mate, if you turned up to all five in person, we'd think there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so, you know, and this was like 2017. Wow. And ain't that the truth. But so the thing is, a hybrid model is quite good, but I do worry that, and I worry, you know, some companies are going to wake up one day and go, God, I've got, I know there's been fraud or there's been stuff going on. Or Do you know the number of people, by the way, I mean, I've, we've seen quite a lot of this in the States. They've got multiple jobs. So they're a full-time employee of Cisco and Palo Alto and so on. We've had about four of them at Palo Alto. They're, they're just not that bright because they put themselves on LinkedIn for every different company, <laughs> and we see them. But, but, but some of them will have two full-time jobs, right? And what they're doing, they're doing, they are actually doing their job. They're just doing 40 hours of work in 20 hours. They work their socks off, but they're doing it for two companies. So there is some interesting things coming out of it. Very interesting. Oh, well, wow. now, John, check out your employees, but you definitely get to jump on <laughs> LinkedIn, folks. Yeah. One of our first conversations uh, was an interesting one. So I worked at a local school here in Christchurch, and coming from Northern Ireland, a public school in a very working class town, went through primary and high school, and didn't know of one kid that killed themselves. Didn't know of one. Not in my yeah. whole town. Kneecapping was certainly more popular in Northern Ireland, but <laughs> when I went work at this school, pretty incredible school here in Christchurch, in the decade that I worked there, we had 10 or more kids 
take their lives. Mm. And I find this just truly mind boggling. And I started to look at New Zealand statistics. I was like, wow, mm. we are winning in terms of we're like number one in the OECD for teen suicide, for domestic violence, child mortality. And I know that our reporting is a lot more accurate um, yeah. compared to some other countries like Italy and so forth. But it got me asking questions around why. What is it with our mental health? And we're talking about this working from home thing and isolating and COVID. What do you think drives the mental health statistics that we have, particularly for our young kids and Maori Pacific specifically? Yeah, so, so the tragedy is you're 100% right that we have you know, quite high stats. Um, to your point, yeah, places like Italy, they're deeply Catholic countries and they won't admit that people are taking their own lives. Um, so they under report, but nevertheless, nevertheless, the numbers very high. So I, I got, I started looking at quite a bit because actually my son's school, he was at King's College in Auckland, they had a number of kids take their own lives, and I mean, yeah, I'd obviously seen stats and read stuff about it, but I, I guess when he started going to funerals, like far too many funerals, and like all parents worry about children taking their own lives, and if we're all honest, everyone worries about that. Um, I started thinking, well, yeah, w what could we do about it? You know, like I'm, I'm theoretically in this position to do something about it, so what could I do about it? So there was actually a guy, believe it or not, and, and he was a world expert in, in suicide, um, and particularly youth suicide. He came out of Norway or somewhere in Scandinavia, I think it was Norway or Denmark, and he was, in, so he was working in Masterton, and I rang him up. The, the Ministry of Health said, this guy's a world expert and he's here for two years. And um, so I rang him up and said, hey, will you come and see me? And he's, he, he was kind of interesting. He goes, no, I'm very busy. You come and see me. I said, okay. <laughs> I like his I said, style. Yeah. I go, yeah, i got nothing else to do. Hey, yeah, sure, no worries, fella. So no, but I thought, no, stuff it. So I got in the crown car, you know, we went over the hill, went to Marston. Anyway, He's a very interesting guy on many fronts. First, one thing he said to me that was very scary, he said, you know, okay, the stereotypical that um, young person that might kill themselves is that they, they withdraw in themselves and they go in their room and they don't talk and, you know, all the signs are there, right? Well, firstly, a lot of young people do that, go in their rooms and go through patches. Oh, that's the first thing. The second thing is, that doesn't mean they're going to kill themselves. The second thing is, apparently, 30 or 40% of all young people that commit suicide show no obvious symptoms or it's, not, it's just not obvious. In fact, the last kid that killed himself at King's when Max was there um, was, um, uh, he was the, Max said to me, of all the people that did it, he would never have picked it. He was the happiest kid in the school. Um, so, so he was actually, you know, the guy that writes in the Herald who died himself actually recently, um, Brian Gaynor, was his son, David Gaynor. And David's a lovely, lovely kid. I knew David Gaynor a little bit, and you honestly, you'd never have picked it. So, so this first thing is that he just said, whatever you think, there's just going to be a group, of, you know, group of people. So, and he said, the reason it's very challenging is everything in your men normal mental state is to stay alive, which is why people will survive with very little food or water. It's why they'll cut their arm off with a pen knife if it's you know trapped under a boulder, and yeah, you know, they'll do it. They'll do everything in your instincts is to live, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas actually you're fighting that. So, so why is that happening? And then in New Zealand, if you look, if you really want to know the stats, this is the horrible reality, and they may have changed a little bit. I don't think they've changed much. Is that we lose about a hundred youngsters a year. Um, we look, about 500 people a year commit suicide, but a lot of them are, are, are a bit older, and some of them have got terminal illness, and maybe in the modern world they'd, they'd invoke euthanasia laws that are there, which is why I was voted for euthanasia. Um, but of the 100 young people, which I think are 18 or below, 90% of them are Maori boys. Mm. Okay, so the, And so the reason that the boys die in big numbers and the girls don't is um, typically the pattern has been girls take tablets and boys hang themselves. And girls will often find them, and so we can save them. Um, whereas, whereas you know, boys, there's no coming back from hanging yourself. And so basically, um, so then you go back and say, okay, well, 
then you start. So I, I got really interested, and we actually started. We did a lot of stuff. We did we did, did a huge amount of stuff. And this is what happens in 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 government, you know, which is the crude reality is, yeah, I think it probably made the news for five minutes one night if you're lucky, and they wrote the odd story, but it's not interesting, like you know, Trevor Mallard belting Tohen around the thing, you know, whatever. Yeah, and so that dominates things, whereas. Serious stuff actually doesn't get nearly enough attention because it's not controversial. You know, you're just doing something, you know. So, but anyway, I reckon if you want to know what I think the driver is, I think a huge amount of the drivers are social media now. I think, I think firstly, okay, yeah, we're better at recognising it. Maybe if you had, you know, whatever, whatever conditional symptom of mental health 30, 40 years ago, we probably didn't recognise it. We probably didn't do anything about it, but... But, but if I was to look at, you know, many of the girls Max has dated, right, um, which has been quite a long list, but <laughs> let's say they're all, honestly, all lovely girls, all beautiful. I don't think he's dated a single girl that honestly hasn't had anorexia or bulimia or... Shit, it's a real worry, eh? You know, it's a massive worry. And I think they get on the internet, and it's not just girls, I mean, it's, you know, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're too this, you're too that, you know, it's all these trolls. See, I don't look, see, I don't look at social media. I had social media when I was Prime Minister, obviously, and, and if you think about how fast and far the world has come, right, so Helen, when she was PM, um, didn't, but she had no social media, wasn't even really there. Like, when we started, we thought we were cutting edge because we had Instagram, we'd put up the odd picture, you know, like, there was no, there was no messaging on that. Facebook, we started building an audience. I mean, Jacinda's got a massive Facebook, big international Facebook following, actually. Huge, huge numbers. And, and so that's the medium under which we all communicate. But if you go and look at the trolls on that stuff, I mean, it is ugly. So even today, I don't even bother, you know, I don't bother reading any of it. I never have. And, um, uh, you know, because, because if you really read that stuff, it would do your head in. But go and tell that to a 15-year-old. And then I think there just are social issues. I mean, if you're really honest, some of these Maori boys, they're up north. Well, they're in Gisborne, the very low levels of deprivation, maybe no father in the household. Like, I went to Huntley High one time, and it's a very low decile school, and the principal said it was after school, it was like about 3.30, and they had these kids, and they were, you know, they were young, young, larger young Maori boys, and they were running around playing rugby or doing something or whatever, and the principal said to me, there's about 50 of them, and he said... Um, what do you notice about those boys? And I said, they're all Maori or Pacific. He said, oh, they're large, yeah, but no. I said, they're all under 15 or something. He went, oh, no. We went through about five things and eventually said, none of them have got a father. None of them have ever had a father. So I'm not saying, I mean, we live in the real world. Divorce rate's 40%. doesn't make you a bad person because you get divorced. Lots of people get divorced. My, my sister's had more husbands than I've had hot dinners. But, you know, um, <laughs> as long as they wear a name badge. Actually, the current one's a fantastic guy. They've been there 20 years, so it'll all be good. But the point is, um, she went through a few prior to that. Um, but, you know, the, 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 but, but the simple facts of life are that I think, you know, you do have some of these households where... There may be no, no father, no family figure, could be quite a lot of drugs, could be, could be abuse. And we sort of wonder, you know, why these things are going on. So, I don't know, but it, it's probably always been there, but man, and it's, not a, it's just not an easy thing to resolve. Mm, 100%. Well, let's change course a wee bit. I want to um, ask you... Bringing together your acuity, your knowledge, your research, your constantly learning and growing, plus your gut feeling. Where are we sitting right now in New Zealand in terms of the economic cycle? Where are we headed? What have we got to brace for? Yeah, so if you go back to, say, 2020, you know, COVID comes along, I was really, really economically negative. Um, I just thought, God, you know, I mean, I couldn't even envisage a world where... You know, you had a tourism business and no tourists could turn up. You had a coffee shop, no one could come to the shop. You had any business. I, I don't even think we could run ANZ Bank, you know, with a $200 billion balance sheet from someone's bedroom, which is essentially what we've been doing. I mean, run it from home. I just didn't see that world. 
And so why was it that we didn't have these terrible scenarios? I'll, I'll tell you the reason why, and that was that massive amounts of government transfers. So they, it wasn't anything new, and I'm not taking away from it. I'm just saying that what we did in Christchurch where we paid people for, for 10 weeks and all that sort of stuff and let businesses try and get back on their feet and pay their employees and stuff, they just copied that, that, that playbook, and that was a good thing to do. And so where people had very low levels of expenses, because you couldn't go out, you couldn't do anything, you couldn't actually spend money, you can't order takeaways, you can't go out to nightclubs, you can't do anything. Um, like Max's girlfriend at the time, who was actually a hairdresser, she made, she made really good money through COVID. Because they came and moved into our house before it all started, they didn't spend a single cent, and the government paid them more net than she was probably getting as a hairdresser. So yeah, they made money, right? And then the second thing was, Interest rates cratered, right? And so, you know, the Reserve Bank pumped money in the system, the government printed money, and you're left with interest rates of 1%. Now, as we know, that led to all these kind of slightly weird outcomes in a way, but, you know, skyrocketing house prices and all these different things. So if I look at it today, the reason I'm a bit more nervous today now, I mean, I, I was nervous then and wrong, but now I'm nervous and I suspect I'm probably right, is that... I do really worry that, just to give you an example, 40%, or well, it's actually technically, 57% of all of ANZ's customers who have a mortgage with us have a mortgage that starts with a two or three in front of it. And in the next six months, they've got to roll that over. And that will have a five in front of it. We think floating interest rates are going to 9%. We think mortgages are going to seven. So there's a huge amount of money coming out of their household. And just to give you an example, you know, you know, when, when, um, oil, when, when petrol prices go up, right, um, it doesn't take very long for Talkback to ring up and go, well, yeah, the, in real simple terms, if the government's getting 15 cents a litre and fuel's a dollar fifteen, they they've made 15 cents and they've only paid a dollar and now it's doubled to $2, they're getting 30 cents, you know, so they, get to, they should cut. GST or cut excise, right, on fuel, because uh, for no, for nothing different, they're making more money. That is right, right? <coughs> I'll tell you what's interesting, though. The GST tax taken in those times stays exactly the same. Do you know why? Because people trade from steak to sausages. So they spend more money on fuel, they spend less money at the supermarket, or less money going out to dinner, or less money on something else, right? So, and what that tells me is the vast bulk of people spend 100% of what they earn relatively low saving rates, consume everything they get. So, um, and the maths in New Zealand broadly are, a third of all people own a home with a mortgage, a third of people own a home with no mortgage, and a third of people rent. So that you, And rents are going through the roof, interest is going through the roof, so at least for two-thirds of the community, they are paying a lot more. Now, the positive part of the story is, we can analyse your data. Like, when I, when I first became chairman of ANZ, I remember the, the guy who was doing the injunction for to me, he said... Um, we can tell if you've got cancer. I said, mate, I thought you were a bank, um, not a hospital. He goes, yeah, I know, but we can tell. I went, oh, OK, yeah, you know, knock my socks off. How, what have I got then? He goes, well, I don't think you've got anything. I said, well, so you can't tell if I've got cancer. He goes, no, no, but I could tell because I can see in your bank account. I'd see your income going down. I'd see you making payments to your oncologist. I can see everything you can do. And we can and do. And on an anonymised basis, we can see everything that's going on. So we've measured the income in the last 12 months from source of everyone that banks with us. It's 40% of New Zealand, so it's a lot. And it's gone up 5.5%. So even though their interest rates are going up, actually what's happening is their income is rising. I know that sounds crazy, but it's definitely true. So they're getting wage rounds or they're doing more, more and different things. So at one level, you might see interest rates go up quite a bit. They might survive quite well um, because they'll probably get pretty decent wage rounds over the next two years. But here's the challenge, and that is that over the last 20 years, any time you've had a big problem, you know, the dot-com crisis, any kind of thing, right, the response for the government has always been, right, um, or central banks pump the place with cash, and that's why the stock markets will rally and everything's come right. They can't do that anymore because in an inflationary environment, you can't do it. And I was in Melbourne, the same Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and on Tuesday night, the Aussie budget was held. And Jim Chalmers is the treasurer, so Minister of Finance over there. They're left-wing you know, they've got very little opposition, so you'd think they'd want to be popular. He got up and said energy prices are going up 50% in the next um, year, 20% this year, 30% next year, but over the next 12-month period, and we're not going to give you anything for it because um, we know it'll be inflationary. So they're worried about all that stuff. 
And then you look around the rest of the world and they've got big things happening at them. Like it's not just Ukraine, but you know, as a result of Ukraine. So energy prices in the UK, gas prices have gone 10x, right? So just to give you an example, for a low to middle income household in the UK, this winter, their power bills will have gone from 6% of their household budget to 40%. So they literally will be saying, I'm not buying pizza, we're not turning the fire on, let's get three blankets, we'll watch TV. I mean, they are going to cut costs. They're gonna, these households are going to have to cut costs. So I do sort of worry that, you know, and I heard Hosking this morning on the radio saying that business numbers were, would, you know, collapses were getting a bit higher. Having said all of that, we see the first signs of stress. So in New Zealand, the last board meeting last week, New Zealand board, number of people who are past 30 days on their credit card is rising. We can see in things that are not in our space, but what I call the non-bank sector, they are deteriorating. So buy now, pay later has gone from 7.5% delinquency to definitely plus 9 and probably greater. Um, mortgagee sales are starting to increase. We are starting to see some stress, but man, it's, very, it's still very benign. Um, so, I'm, so I'm not, you know, doom and gloom. I'm just saying... There's just more potential stress in the system. And what are the controllables? So if you were back in office right now and you, you could see this and you had this information, what are the controllables and the levers that you think you, you would start pulling? Yeah, so look, you, you have to get more out of what you're spending and you fundamentally have to spend less. Mm. So, you know, uh, I, I did this podcast um, a wee while ago and they were two university students and one's hardcore right wing, it's actually a girl, because that's unusual, because you know, theoretically, hardcore political parties, one side or the other, are typically right wing is more male oriented, left wing is more female oriented. But no, yeah, no, obviously. Yeah, and, and the guy was left wing, right? And so he was really trying to get stuck into me, and I said to him, okay, well, name me one single social stat that's got better under the current government. Name me one. He goes, well, you're just being smart ass. I said, well, no, I'm, not. I'm just asking the, the obvious question. Name one. Like, the number of people are homeless. Well, four times as many people live in a car that did when I was Prime Minister. Number of people on a benefit, 23% more. You can just go through every single stat. You know, number of people, the amount of time they're waiting to get into a hospital, the amount of time they're waiting to get surgery. Yeah, you know, you know, that RAM raids. I mean, God, you know, how safe do we all feel in, the, in our house? You know, all the stuff you go on and on and on. And I only raise that because this government is spending so much more money than we did. So the point is, are they getting anything for it? Well, it's not obvious to me. So I think they've got to get some discipline back in the place and start saying, spend money wisely instead of just throwing money around like it's no tomorrow. And then actually spend it on the things you really want. So when we ran zero budgets for three years under Bill, but we spend more money in health, education and, wealth, and, and um, science and less money on everything else. Some people might not like it, but that's the reality of any household. You've got to spend money more wisely. I think the other thing I'd still say is that comes back to that point I was making about confidence earlier that I just sort of think we've kind of got this attitude at the moment that I don't know that we I don't know we just don't seem to, we don't like well off people and we don't like businesses that succeed and well okay great but you know I, okay just give an example so they're all out belting ANZ last night you know Robertson's down on TV and that sort of stuff do you know we pay five percent of all corporate tax in New Zealand we have five percent of all corporate tax one in every twenty dollars we pay it so it's quite a lot. So yeah, you can get rid of us if you want to, but that's a lot of moolah you've got to find from somewhere else, you know? And, and it's, it's like, you know, um, I don't know, I, I, I get frustrated sometimes because obviously I know a lot of, for whatever reason, well-off people. They, most of them are the most generous people I meet. Half the time the least, claiming the least credit and doing the most things. So... Don't we want role models? Don't we want people to be, be successful? I mean, the reason that we love the All Blacks or the, you know, Black Ferns or, you know... Or yeah. Ireland. Sorry? Or Ireland. Or Ireland, yeah. But the reason we love those kind of people is because we think they're role models for our young people and that they'll aspire to be like that. Well, but I think we should also, you know, say, well, it's incredible if you can be Rod Duke and Bill Briscoe's or you can be any nature of sort of business. I mean, Christchurch has got heaps of them, of very, very successful men and women who've done incredible things. And I, I just, I don't know, I just think you want to, you want people to believe that they can. The 
fact that they might not want to is fine, but I, I want to encourage them. Like, that's what we try to do when we were there, try to cut bureaucracy and cut your retail. And that's like, you know, it's like Donald Trump. I mean, okay, the guy's certifiable sometimes. I get all that. But actually, when you look at what he did on the business side, I mean, there's other things, but, you know, a little more interesting. But on the business side, he actually cut miles of red tape, taxes. He actually permitted stuff to actually happen. Mm. Like, the, the, the economy actually went well. It was just the other stuff that was nuts. Yeah, fair. <laughs> of which it was quite a lot. <laughs> so if you were put in a position and you were a permanent resident in yep. Hawaii, not a part-time resident, yep. and you had to vote and you had the opportunity to go Hillary or Trump, which way would you go and why would you go there? Well, I'd vote, I'd vote for Trump. Um, which drives Brona mad. She, she, I mean, she's a good little right wing voter. Always voted national entire life, and she hates Trump. And I always say to her, which really drives them even crazier. I go, Trump is a symptom of the problems. He's actually not the problem. You might think he's the problem, but he, you only get there when people vote for you. And in America's case, only one in two people vote. So only n- never any more than twenty five percent of Americans have voted for their president because. Half of them don't vote, and the other half vote for someone else, right? But, but the point being, why did that group who bother voting want him there? And because and it's because they think they they like the messages he's saying, which is your life ain't fair, China's not playing fair, all these different sorts of things, right? Um, so I, I you know, on the basis, I'm never going to vote for the left. Don't care what happens. I'm never doing it anyway, and I don't agree with not voting. I'd vote for Trump. But, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's obviously a lot of stuff that, you know, some of the stuff is pretty incredible and, you know, but that's a choice, isn't it? If, it's a bad, if you've got bad choices, then... Yeah, you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice, yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. And New Zealand tends to really punch above its weight in certain areas. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so we take the All Blacks, Black Ferns, yeah. for example. Uh, why is that? Why does such a small country with such, such a small population, why are we able to thrive when it comes to that high performance and that leadership end of things? We, yeah, just on the sporting front, because I, I think sport's one thing that we understand and it's sort of neutral. You know, people don't necessarily want to go to work and talk about a whole lot of other issues because... You know, like and in some countries that you know they'll ban Thanksgiving coming up in the next couple of weeks in the US, and they'll ban discussions about politics because it's just got so hot to handle. And even in New Zealand, it's got more polarising. I think partly because of social media as well. I think, um, but but I think yeah, we, but when Murray was the Martin McCulley was the sports minister and. Um, I was Prime Minister, we put a lot more money into high performance sport. Uh, I saw Mike Stanley on TV the other day actually say, you know, acknowledging that, saying that, you know, we've been much better resourced over the last you know, while. And the reason we did that was because I reckon New Zealanders like to see our people winning. And you think about the Olympic Games or the Commonwealth Games, we've had remarkable results recently across all sorts of disciplines, all sorts of sports. And I just think that, you know, we and we absolutely do punch above our weight when you think about the population, the number of medals we've been getting at these kind of events. I think we just like to feel like we're doing that. And I, I always like the fact that, you know, there was a bit of, you know, into sport and out of court type of thing. And and tying up young people, you know, and they you know, get them involved in some sport, they're far less likely to get into some, you know, big problem, you know, wear them out. Um, and, 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 and also we live in a country which is sort of very much outdoors orientated. You know, we like all that. We like going out and sort of being there and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think that that's... that, But that's just one part of it. But, yeah, I think winning kind of matters and... It's like this ridiculous notion that we have in the world that we live in that apparently you can't keep the score if your kids are six and they're playing touch rugby. Well, yeah, OK, the only people who don't keep the score are the people who tell you you can't keep the score because the kids know the score, right? The referee seems to know the score, but apparently we're not allowed to count that, you know? And I just reckon that's nonsense. That's not the real world we live in. The real world we live in, people do keep the score of all sorts of things. And, and by the way, we're going to keep the score when it comes to whether our emissions profile is right. We're going to keep the score about whether our average income beats that of Australia. We're going to keep the score of how many drugs we're prepared to fund. I mean, there's nothing wrong with keeping the score. Actually, keeping the score keeps elected people who want to go into office honest to focus on the things that you think are important. I truly agree with you know what you measure matters and keeping the score. So for the business leaders here... What should they 
be measuring? What are the, if you were to, to step into a business right now in a governance role and that business was struggling, uh, the great resignation stuff that they're talking about, the churn of their staff, yeah. what are the things that you would, would be saying, hey, I need you to be focusing on these. These are your measurables for the year. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it depends on what stage your business is at, and you know, are you an early startup or are you, you know, a highly developed, successful business? You know, there's a big continuum in there. But, but for the most part, what you always worry about, I think, is you know, basically, are you making money? Now, you know, there are plenty of startups and plenty of businesses that you know, there's no expectation of them to make money in day one because that's not the phase they're at. And in fact, actually, if they're not pouring it into R and D and development and, and growing then actually the, the investors would be worried about that because it's not about today, it's about where it might be in five years. But philosophically, you know, do you have a profitable, you know, are you on a track at least or are you profitable? I think the second thing is are you, are you keeping ahead of the competition? See, one of the things I worry about in the, for instance, the banking space is that <coughs> our competitors, we might sit around and want to believe our competitors are BNZ or ASB or Westpac, they're not. Our competitors are rocket. So you go and have a look in the United States. The number one mortgage provider in the United States is not Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, or any of these other guys, JP Morgan Chase. It's Rocket. So Rocket is a fully online digital offering, and Rocket is huge. So the reason Rocket advertises at the Super Bowl, which is you know five million dollars a commercial for thirty seconds or whatever, is because they're making a truckload of money. And the reason they're making a truckload of money, ANZ Australia's. We're about a year away from getting this done, but you would literally go online and you would get your mortgage. Everything would be done totally digitally from soup to nuts in about seven minutes. <clears throat> and then you go along and say, yeah, okay, I'm going to buy this property. I'm going to do all this sort of stuff. So my point is I'd, one of the things, so I'd, I'd worry about profitability and the balance sheet and all those things, but I'd also worry about where am I in terms of research and development and all that sort of stuff? So, again, if you go and have a look at it, go and have a look at the number of companies in the Fortune 500 that are there today that were there, say, 50 years ago. I think the answer is there's about five of them. The car companies largely that have survived and probably not in the form that they were, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so what happens is you, you can't imagine it, but the world just is so different, eh? And, and so, like, I was at an ANZ board meeting, um, let's say, this week, and the CEO, who's, who's a good guy, he got, he, but he got up and he said, oh, we're spending $2.1 billion in, in, in technology this year, and that's more than we spent ever in the history of the bank, and that's amazing, and that just shows you, you know, how, how kind of right we are. And I said, yeah, well, with the greatest respect, that's cool, but is that the right number? Maybe it should be two and a half billion or three billion. He said, "Well, you're being ridiculous." I said, "Well, how many branches are you opening?" And the answer is none. So the reason we don't open branches and the reason we close branches is not to be annoying to customers and politicians. It's because no one goes there. They're like ghost towns, right? No one goes there. No one wants to go to the branch. Everyone wants to go on the ANZ Go Money and move money around and you know use you know Apple Pay or whatever you want to use. That that's that's the future. So. The fact that we run our whole life on that. And so I, I would be really looking at, if I was the company, if you don't have a really good digital strategy and you don't understand social media. So like, for instance, um, Max does a lot of that. for the, He's in partnership with the Stonewood guys. And so he runs the Stonewood Key stuff. And he, he looks after, amongst a whole lot of things, I mean, you know, he's the investor with them. But um, he looks after all this social media and stuff, and he says it's really interesting when you look at, like, they're very Chinese, so not to take the wrong way, but it's pretty linear in the way that they look at some things. So they'll just put a render of a house up, and they think that's success. And he'll go, do you know what, that al what that's doing to the algorithm? It's turning everybody off, because nobody looks at that, because it's boring. Whereas, that, you know, go and have a look at TikTok and what goes viral... It's quirky, weird stuff. Like, I tell you what, they're interested in politicians. It's like when Bill did that um, pizza with bloody um, spaghetti on I mean, I rang him up and said, you're a loser. But, um, <laughs> but I said, at least it'll be interesting. You know, like, people are interested. You know, like, that's what they like. They like the little sneak peek into um, another world and, and, and behind the th scenes and the things they can't always see. So I think you've got to have, in the, the world we live in, you have to have a really good social media. I mean, and ultimately is, can you, can you keep and recruit your staff? And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with people leaving, actually. McKinsey's are famous for you're either up or out. You know, you're either getting better or you're leaving. Mm -hmm. um, 
and but but can you you know can you attract the right people? I would rather have you know one or two people I really like than fifty people that I don't think are very good. I I, I think we sometimes kid ourselves that volume is the answer, but it's actually not the answer. It's a, it's about the quality of people we've got and whether they're motivated and actually fundamentally whether they like each other. I mean, there is an argument. They don't have to be best friends and go to each other's houses for dinner, but do they philosophically as a team kind of support each other and want to be there? Because the teams, because when, when I was in Parliament, I had, I mean, by definition, over time, people moving, so I had three chief press secretaries in that time, but most of these people, no one ever, le- you know, people didn't leave, and, you know, sometimes they'd leave, you know, for some really big thing, and I, or I'd encourage them to go, like my chief economic advisor, I sent off the IMF, or Nikki, I made her go out and get a job because I knew she was always going to come back and have a big role in Parliament. But my point just being that that um, people wanted to be there, they liked it, you know, and they enjoyed it, like they enjoyed it. And I think when, you, when you're in an environment that feels like that, even just, even, it might even be, like we would do, there would be horrendous stuff, like these guys would be working honestly, 19 hours a day, six and a half days of the week, because they knew on Sunday I had to give some speech that had to stack up on whatever we were announcing at national conference that was going to get ripped apart. But there was just something about that, you know, that at two in the morning they'd be eating pizzas and drinking Steinlager and writing the rest of the speech, which was half time, while well, it was so incoherent. But the, um, <laughs> it could be the way I delivered it. But the I point being that, you know, they loved, they kind of enjoyed it. So yeah. there's some soft stuff in there. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. And just before we pass it over for some Q&A, one last question. I always like to wrap up with this last question. So we, when we connect, often talk about family and what that means to us, and family means a lot to you. So if we were to fast forward, it's your last day here on earth, and a dear one in your life, maybe a, a grandchild or someone very young, five or six years old, comes up and says, John, how do I lead my life with purpose? What would your advice be to them? I think make every day count. I mean, you know, I always used to say to young people, um, you know, because I, I, I mean, I went to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of schools in the eight and a bit years I was Prime Minister, so it was a lot, like a lot. And I, I used to say to them, look, do you know that the average, the average man in New Zealand dies at 82 and the average woman dies at 84, right? And it goes up by two and a half years for every 10 years, right? So I was, I was in the car, I'll never forget one time, I was with, in the car with Max, and he was about 14, and he said, how old do you think I'll be when I die? It's one of those kids' questions that kids sort of ask, right? And I said, is that a reflection on the way I'm driving? And he went, <laughs> no, I just sort of wondered. And I said, well, you know, the average man dies at 82, the average woman dies at 84, goes up two and a half years by every 10 years. You're a bright boy, do the maths, tell me. And he goes, 100. And I went, that's right, you'll be 100 on average. Wow. On average, you'll be 100, right? So at one level, we think, oh, that's an amazingly long time. But on another, another thing, firstly, that's an average. And secondly, you, it's such a short period of time in the history of things. Like Clinton was famous for, he had, he had a bit of the moon rock that they brought back from Apollo 11 on his desk. And he used to, when people used to come in, they used to be screaming at each other in the Oval Office. He said to me, you know, I used to show them the moon rock and say... That's what a long time looks like. So let's just stop the yelling and get an answer. Mm. You know? And I, I guess, you know, it's like anything in life. You, you can't put wisdom on, on, you know, like youth is wasted on the young people, isn't it? You know, type of thing. But so I'm 61, you know, like incredibly young looking 61. I sort of accept <laughs> that, but it's hard to believe. But I'm 61. And I can't, honestly, I don't feel any different to when I was 21 than Christchurch. Incredible. You know, way a bit more, and unfortunately, and but you know, and I've had lots of experiences, but but I I don't feel all it, it just but somehow time catches up with everyone. You know, eventually it goes through. And I always say to our kids, I was and and that one of the reasons when you know when I went into Parliament and I just really wanted to be Prime Minister. I mean, for obviously when you when you're ten and I wanted to be Prime Minister, it's different from when you're forty and I actually ran for office. And by the time I was forty, I you know you have to have that kind of A type personality and a fair degree of you know kind of either self confidence or arrogance. You can call it whatever. Like. Well, I genuinely thought I could make New Zealand a better place. I genuinely wanted to do it. Right or wrong, that's what I thought. And, but the most important thing was I didn't want to die wondering. And I always used to say to young people when I went to school, I used to say, look, I'll tell you why most of you won't do the things that you should do. I'll tell you why. 
It's not because you're worried um, about failing yourself. Because actually most of you can probably accept that, right? You're worried about what you think other people will think if you fail, right? So, you, so in the end, the, the, the reserve position is, well, I don't do anything. By definition, if I don't do anything, then I won't fail. If I don't fail, then no one will criticise me. So it's quite a big step when you, and I think that's what, that's what you know, sports people feel when they go on the thing. You know, they, feel, they feel the enormous pressure of being out there, but then they feel the joy, you know, the euphoria. And that's probably what they miss, actually, when they're no longer there. And so I just sort of thought, I don't want to die wondering. And I think what I would say to them is, look, I'm going to die happy. I really am. I mean, you know, I probably if I fly the helicopter I'm currently flying into the mountain, I won't be that happy for that second. But I'm going to die happy because I'm going to look back and think, what a ride. Like I got to do amazing things. Like it's a cool life. And that's what I would say to Max and Steffi. I, go, I don't care what you guys do. It's, it's your life. You've got to lead it however you want. But don't get to the end of it with regrets. Get there and think, hey, it was awesome, you know, and, and we live in the real world, like, you know, in a world, if you meet someone that's a cancer survivor, they'll tell you, I worry much less today than I worried, you know, three years ago about the little stuff, because I was up against the wall and I didn't think I was going to get there, but that's, a no, that, that, that's, that's nice, but we actually live in the real world where if the kids do something, it annoys you, if it's, you know, if they tell you they're going to be home at 12 o'clock and they're home at three in the morning, it annoys you, or, you know, that's the real world we live in, and it doesn't matter how horrific whatever you're going through is, you'll still get annoyed by little, you're always going to sweat little stuff. So don't even worry about the fact you worry about little stuff, just accept that it's part of life. But actually underneath it all, so many people it sort of strikes me just aren't really happy, and I don't think it's just money, because a lot of the things that Brian and I do, we have lots of fun, and... Like, like, we get up in the morning, most mornings, and we, we walk around the domain where we are and, and thing, and we get coffee, and I kind of get up in the morning and I look forward to it, you know, it's kind of fun, it's not, it doesn't cost anything, um, but it's fun, you know, and, and, and I think it's so easy to be negative, but I don't know, do we really have that much to be negative about? I mean, we're, we have, we're victims of tremendous luck. If we were born in Sudan, life would be terrible. Or if we were born in Ukraine at the moment, life would be terrible. 100%. So, you know, we, we, we have a lot, a lot to be grateful for and a lot to celebrate. And then just, just close your eyes and go for it. Because even if you don't get the... You, you know, I'd, I'd, way rather, I'd way rather give it a go and fail than never give it a go and never have achieved anything. Thank you for sharing that. Great insight. Let's put our hands together for Sujan P. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content today, please smash that subscribe button below. And if you want to become part of my community, I've got an amazing free Facebook group. Please come and join us. The link is in the description below. And also, if you've got any questions about today's session, I'd love to know. Just comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you guys. Have the most amazing day.